Well, we have a special guest today. It's uh, Ben Witherington III. And I guess you could say Ben probably knows a thing or two about the scriptures. Uh, studied it most of his life, I guess. He's uh, he's written a few books. I think I think somewhere maybe a, I don't know a neighborhood of sixty or so. Uh, he's been a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, and uh, we're going to be discussing uh, his book, "A Week in the Life of Corinth." So, uh, Ben, welcome to the show. Well, good to be with you. All right. Well, let's just start off maybe a little personal information before we get into your book. How did you come to uh, faith? Your conversion experience? Um, well, I've, I'm a cradle Methodist. I've been in the church my whole life. So I don't have a conversion experience of any dramatic kind to tell you. Uh, what is the case is there comes a point when you become an adult where, the, where you embrace the faith of your family for yourself or you don't and that happened for me when i was at carolina and uh became involved with intervarsity christian fellowship and uh was very happy to not only reaffirm but embrace in a new and full way what i had believed um since i was very little so yeah so oh, okay i i get that uh you know a lot of people you know they're uh some people are just i say born with the bible you know they're just brought up in a home and christian faith and well my my mama tells me my first two words were john wesley i kind of doubt that but yeah yeah i'm absolutely a cradle methodist and have been all my life yeah uh, my, my first my daughter's first words were hallelujah now whether people believe that or not i heard it with my own two ears and well was, was shocked well at least it wasn't liberty <laughs> yeah yeah there you go there you go so uh, when did you feel the call uh call into ministry teaching so forth well, uh, I went to college between 70 and 74 BC, you know, before cell phone. And um, I, I had an, a fabulous Bible teacher at Carolina named Dr. Bernard Boyd. Uh, over 5,000 people went to seminary as a result of his ministry at Carolina between 1955 and 1977. And I was one of those. In fact, just about all my friends that were in InterVarsity and studied with Bernard Boyd went on to seminary. Uh, and we're still good friends today with most of those. They either became ministers or teachers, or they took their Christian faith to some other practice as a form of ministry. And um, so, uh, you know, these were turbulent times. This was the Vietnam War. This was the Watergate scandal. This was Kent State students being shot and killed for protesting the Vietnam War by National Guardsmen. Um, and really all of that led to an enormous amount of spiritual searching for all kinds of different people. A lot of people, in fact, went to seminary to avoid the draft. I, I was not one of those because my draft board in High Point, North Carolina, never got to my number. But uh, I had friends who were drafted number one and immediately uh, left Carolina and went and joined the Peace Corps. So very turbulent times for students in college. And uh, when I went to seminary, there were people at the seminary who had deliberately gone to seminary to avoid going to Vietnam. So it was it was a challenging time. Now, none of that applies to me. I went to seminary because I felt called and led to do so. And um, Bernard Boyd was a grad of Princeton. He wanted me to go to Princeton, so I applied to Princeton. But uh, having been growing up in, uh, in, in uh, a mainline denomination in the United Methodist Church, I really wanted to have a more evangelical education because I've already heard the mainline shtick, knew that really well. And I wanted to hear the other side of the coin. And uh, what I didn't know, I mean, I'm from Charlotte. So Leighton Ford and Billy Graham said, you should go to Gordon Conwell. That's the one we sponsor. And I said, well, okay, if Billy says go, you go. <laughs> if you're from Charlotte. And so I went. What I didn't know is that it was a reformed seminary, not a Wesleyan or 
Methodist seminary. There were a couple of Methodist professors there and a couple of more broadly Arminian folks there, but basically the theology department was reformed. And so I really got to hear the other side of the coin that I had not heard growing up in the Methodist church. I mean, we read Calvin and Luther and you name it. You know, we read Karl Barth, Burkauer, Burkhoff, Hodge, Warfield, Van Til, Out the Wazoo, uh, and Jonathan Edwards. And uh, what that all did for me is confirm in my own mind and heart why I wasn't part of that tradition. You know, I, I was appreciative of the tradition and learning from it, but uh, it it just confirmed uh, in in my mind, in my heart, that there was a better way to read the scriptures. And so, um, you know, I felt really good about that. I had wonderful teachers at Gordon-Conwell. I had Gordon Fee, uh, Andrew, Link Andrew Lincoln, David Scholler, Ramsey Michaels, you name it. I had wonderful Bible teachers, and that prepared me to go on to the University of Durham and do a Ph.D., with the then foremost Methodist New Testament scholar in the world, C.K. Barrett. And uh, and that was fantastic. Uh, I It was an embarrassment of riches at Durham. I had wonderful Bible teachers, theologians, church history teachers. It was all good. So, I mean, I had a, a really world-class and diverse education in college in seminary and then at the doctoral level. And it really prepared me well for whether I was going to be a scholarly pastor or whether I was going to be a teacher. And uh, I came back to North Carolina in 1980, pastored four churches at once, and then two churches in the mountains of North Carolina. I did some part-time teaching for Duke Divinity School and for High Point College in my hometown. And uh, I would have been perfectly happy continuing to pastor, but I got called. I'm one of those weird people that has never applied for a teaching job. I got called by Ashland Seminary uh, to come and teach at Ashland Seminary. They needed a Methodist to look after their 75 Methodists, and they needed me to teach Bible. And that was all good as far as I was concerned. So we moved to Ashland, Ohio, and they had four campuses. So basically, I was a circuit rider as a Methodist going to four campuses. You fit Deep. right in. I, I was perfect. I was like already already used to that. It was sort of manifest destiny is what it was. Uh, and, and, you know, those were 11 good years between 84 and 95. And then the president of Asbury Seminary said, man, this is Max Dunham. We need to get you to get your hindquarters down here to Asbury. We're going to start a doctoral program in biblical studies, and we need you. And that that was basically the literal phone call that told me to go to Asbury uh, Seminary. Again, not a job I applied for. So, uh, you know, I've been there since 95. We got the doctoral program going now 14 years ago, and uh, we have... 57 doctoral students in biblical studies. So I'm up to my eyeballs and paddling hard with really the brightest and the best, best possible students I could have in Bible, trying to train them to be good teachers or scholarly pastors uh, for their own context. Half domestic, half, half foreign students. So it's a nice balance. Uh, you know, about oh, 60% men, 40% women. Again, a nice balance. And uh, it's been it's been a good almost 30 years now at Asbury teaching. Is, is most of your teaching, is it online or is it in person now? Oh, we don't do online with the doctoral program. Okay. It's a traditional five-year, knock them out and drag them out, five-year program. Now, I do do online teaching at the master's level. We have some of that, but even those classes are hybrids. So for example, I'll go for a week and teach for 20 or some hours on site with those students. And then the rest of the class will be online. Um, I, I generally don't do just purely online classes. Well, before we get into it, maybe speak, uh, what about the, the revival that was made such a big splash here, what was it, a year or so ago? Uh, 
yeah, it was a year ago, February, in fact. It was at the college, not at the seminary. Uh, so across the street. Uh, and it was a big deal. It was a really big deal because, A, it was student-led and student-fed and uh, student-run. And uh, fortunately, the faculty and the administration was start, smart enough to stay out of the way and and prohibited invaders from coming in, you know, from CBN and evangelists wanting to get in on the deal and, you know, lead the deal. And no, uh, it was... It was a time for these students to either go deeper in their faith or be renewed in their faith or to repent of their sins. And I mean, there was a lot of coming to the altar, weeping, repenting, uh, you know, giving up pornography, this, that, and the other, um, which was powerful. And, and what I will mainly tell you is that if you had gone into Hughes Auditorium while it was happening, because it went on for 16 straight days, day and night right the sense of the presence of the holy spirit was just palpable like you know most people would say they had never experienced that much of a living sense of the presence of god in their midst it was just like overpowering really and uh you know it was it was a work that needed to be done for those students and and the faculty that attended it as well, and uh, praise God. Hmm. What What was the spark for that? Were Were there groups praying or fasting or doing any any type what, of thing? Or actually, there no preparation. There was just a day when students decided to stay after chapel. I mean, they're required to attend chapel at the college, and there was a day when a bunch of them just stayed after, and they kept singing and kept praying and and the holy spirit fell on them it's kind of like acts two you know and and then word got i mean it's a small town five thousand small campus the word got around and people came running and the next thing you know it was like a contagious disease you know people were coming out of the woodwork wanting to be a part of this and we're all excited now you have to understand that asbury has a history of these kinds of movements of the spirit, this is this is not novel, um, and and for some reason it always seems to have to do with Hughes Auditorium, which is the old, indeed antique auditorium that was one of the first buildings built at Asbury College uh, in the Holiness uh, period in the late nineteenth century when the college was founded. So it has a long history of of being a holy place. And um, so that's that's kind of the story of what happened. And I I was really thankful that the president at Asbury University said, no, you know, you, you can we set up screens so everybody could see what was happening inside out on the campus. But he was going to let this be what it was and not try to gerrymander it or direct it or you know any of that sort of stuff and i think that's exactly right so the way it ended was as it happened day 16 was the day of the national day of prayer for students at christian colleges so they hooked up with all these other christian colleges and all these other christian colleges i mean some of them came some of them came in bus, boat you know bus loads to be part of this and uh, and there was just a, you know, there were many revivals that were sparked by this in other colleges too. So it it was a good outpouring, and uh, a, a very uplifting, uh, gentle, kind, loving experience. Mm, yeah, we need more of that. Well, well, thanks for that. We'll move on to the to your book here, and folks, we'll put this in the show notes like we always do. But so. A Week in the Life of Corinth, uh, great book. Uh, and so may maybe we'll just kick it off here with just a little bit of history of of Corinth, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Ben. And maybe, well, I mean, we don't want to get to go too far back. Maybe just start maybe 146 B.C. and kind of work it up maybe to the time of Paul, some of the events that kind of shaped the city during that time frame. Sure. Um, what happened is that this Greek city, 
was um, overrun by the Romans in uh, the second century BC and then again in the first century BC. And so what happened was it was turned into a Roman colony city. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that the administration of the city and the official legal language of the city is Latin, not Greek. Uh, they they have a, a Roman governor or, you know, a person we would call the mayor, really, running it. And uh, this had been going on now for well over 100 years, really, before Paul got there in somewhere around 50, 51, 52 AD. And that was all right, because what it meant was uh, anybody who was a Roman citizen had a natural in in a Roman colony city. And it's not an accident that Paul deliberately went to Roman colony cities in the Roman Empire. He went to the city of Antioch, he went to Iconium, he went to Philippi, he went to Corinth. All of those cities were Roman colony cities. Now, what is a Roman colony city? It's where the Roman government knew, because when you're establishing an empire, you need a lot of military. They were mustering out soldiers all over the empire, because not all of them can come back to Italy. I mean, there's no place to put them. You know, if the, if the whole Roman army came back to Rome, uh, all the rest of the residents would have had to leave. And so uh, these Roman colony cities were sort of, okay, here's your 40 acres and a mule, and you're mustering out, and you're going to live in Corinth. And that's what happened. So uh, there is this overlay, top level of a town that's Romans running the official show there, even though the majority of the town was Greek-speaking people. Um, so really, it's like a situation of occupation. That, that's kind of what it was. Paul was a Roman citizen, however, as well as being a person who grew up in a Greek, a great Greek city of Tarsus, and then educated as a Jew in Jerusalem. So, I mean, he, he checked all the boxes uh, for the clientele that he would run into in Corinth. Now, what had also happened is that as a result of the Romans pacifying uh, the Mediterranean and, and then basically running the Mediterranean and even calling it Mare Nostrum, our sea, uh, trade was going to town. And the best trade city in all of the middle of the empire was Corinth because it had two oceans. It had ocean in the Adriatic, it had the Aegean on both sides. And uh, and it was the crossroads of the middle of the Mediterranean. And as a result, I mean, the population of the city of Corinth in Paul's lifetime probably went from about 13,000 to 50-some thousand, which is huge for an ancient city, to say the least. And then there were a lot of transients, a lot of people coming and going. So in many ways, it was the perfect kind of crossroads town to be an evangelist in because you're going to meet all kinds of people going in various directions. And, you know, you, you, the seed of the gospel would be scattered to the winds uh, when you're meeting all these transient people coming through Corinth, to say the least. So that's that's kind of the, the situation we're talking about uh, when Car when Paul gets there. And um, he, he was there for at least a year and a half on the first try. He went back later, as we learn from the end of the Book of Romans. He was in Kinkere, which is the eastern port of Corinth. And it, it was one of his more fruitful places to be. And one of the lessons we learned from this is that Paul was not just sort of itinerant evangelist, you know, one week here, one week there, one week elsewhere. No, he was a church planter. This is the important thing to understand. He would try to go and stay in a place long enough to be able to plant a church. And so he was over a year and a half in Corinth in the first try. He was two and a half years in Ephesus, first try. He was in Philippi several times over, you know. So the idea of him sort of running pell-mell around the 
empire being Billy Graham is not the right image at all of, of Paul. He's a church planter. So that's the kind of context out of and into which I was writing A Week in the Life of Corinth. Yeah, I think that that was so strategic too, having the seas on both sides and maybe speak a little bit to how they, I think it was a four mile stretch where they actually, when the ships would come in, the bigger ships, they would unload the cargo and ship it across there. Some of the smaller ships, they would actually take the ships and move them to keep from having to sail all that time around the coast there. So maybe elaborate a little bit more on that and how that affected the economy and the trade. The, the, the hilarious story is from a little bit later time, namely the time of Nero, the hilarious story is that Nero wanted to dig, dig a canal. And so he actually started a canal and the priest said, oh, no, no, the Adriatic is a higher ocean than the Aegean. It'll flood the land. So stop that, which is, of course, hilarious. But that's what stopped the canal. And the canal was not continued until the 19th century when the French came and did the digging. So, so it, it only took another 1900 years before they completed the canal. Uh, but um, yes, you're absolutely right. The deal cost, which is the little road about four miles from uh, the from the Adriatic to the Aegean, the small boats, they would just put on a sledge and the slaves would drag them across the four miles to the other ocean. Because, I mean, the Peloponnese, huge piece of land and dangerous. The, the southern cape of Greece was was dangerous. And you have to remember, most of these boats are small. Only the grain freighters were like, you know, the big cargo ships today. Mm -hmm. And even them were smaller than the, than the, you know, cargo ships are today, oil tankers, that sort of thing. So um, anything that could lessen the danger of the travel and uh, shorten the travel, all good. And, and Corinth was the place where you could do that. When these uh, sailors would step foot on land, what would they encounter there within, say, the first mile there? I, I, you know, they've been out to sea. Yep. Well, the first thing, the first thing you, you need to be careful about is that a lot of the literature we have on ancient Corinth as a Greek city didn't apply directly to the time of the Roman city. So a lot of things about, you know, sacred prostitutes in the temple of Aphrodite up on top of the Agra Corinth, the, the mountain behind the city and that sort of stuff. You have to be real careful about what you just simply assume was going on in Rome, uh, which had previously gone on during the time it was a Greek city. Nevertheless, like many seaport towns, there were a plenty of taverns, uh, plenty of places to eat and, and get drinks. And of course, there were plenty of prostitutes as well. So uh, like many seaport towns today, you have those kinds of things for men who have been at sea too long. And, and again, I mean, this is a whole patriarchal world. I mean, you don't have female sailors. You don't have women running boats. Uh, these are all men looking for something to do while they're offloading their goods and that sort of stuff. And so, I mean, that that is part of the picture of Roman Corinth, but it's not the whole story because what you learn about Corinth is Corinth was a city where many people went to get healed. There was a temple of Asclepius, the god of healing. And to, to this day, the the symbol of Asclepius with, with the snakes and the staff and all of that, uh, that's the symbol of the god Asclepius. And uh, most of these temples, including the Temple of Apollo and the Temple of Asclepius, had dining rooms. So Paul actually has to deprogram some new Christians who are more socially elite from taking part in the dinner parties in honor of the god Asclepius or in honor of the god Aphrodite or in honor of the god Apollo because 
there was a religious function to these dining mm -hmm. parties. And that's actually what 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 is all about. Okay to eat the meat, but don't go to the dinner parties in the temple where the god uh, Asclepius is said to be present and, and attending. And his statue is sitting on a couch right next to you. And then there's prayers offered to the god Asclepius. Uh, not good for new Christians. And especially Christians who had come not from a Jewish background, but from a polytheistic background, where they believed in multiple gods. So Paul had to do quite a lot of deprogramming of people who were new Christians in Corinth. He definitely had a radical message for them, something, something they had never heard before. Well, yes, this idea of a crucified God was as much of an oxymoron as Microsoft works. It just didn't compute. Well, well uh, getting into your book, the, the I guess the main character we see through that is, uh, maybe I'm going to butcher the name, is it Nicanor? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the background of the book, since this was the first book in that whole series. Uh, um, Dan Reed uh, and I went for hot dogs at the Varsity in Atlanta during the Society of Biblical literature meaning uh, many moons ago now in Atlanta and cooked up this series. And I said, you know, actually, you're going to have an easier time getting lay people to read historical fiction than you are a stuffy theology book. And I, I have an honors English degree from Carolina. Some of us can write fiction. Some of us can't, you know, but I, I could certainly do that. I didn't have any problems doing that. And so, uh, you know, I said, well, let's have a go with this. Uh, initially, the book was going to be called Nicanor's Dilemma. And then InterVarsity thought they liked the, the first one I did. I mean, I did two of them, Week in the Life of Jerusalem, as well as Week in the Life of Corinth. And they liked the first one so much, and it just went gangbusters. Suddenly, it became a textbook all over the place for college, Christian college courses, about uh, Paul and his letters. And uh, it went through 12 printings. And they went, oh, we need to do a whole series of these. What's next? And I'm going, um, well, here's five people I can recommend that could write a good volume, uh, including my successor, David De Silva, uh, you know, several others, uh, Gary Burge, you name it. And uh, so it kind of launched the whole series of A Week in the Life of. And, uh, and the idea was, to pick a week that was crucial to the ministry of this person or that person or, you know, the Christian setting and really thoroughly tell the story. Uh, and, but tell it from an angle that might be unexpected. I mean, Nicanor begins the story and not as a Christian person at all. He's a, a, a slave, in fact, a well-educated slave who's working for a particular uh, elite, socially elite person, uh, in, in this case, Erastus, who is the city treasurer. And so, you know, um, it was it was really a lot of fun to do, you know, and I picked the week where Paul went to trial before Gallio. So, you know, we'd, we'd have some inherent drama that's actually in the Bible, as well as the drama of what's going on with Nicanor as well. Yeah, so Nicanor is a, a, a freed man. He's kind of trying to get his own businesses together. He's got two businesses, and um, like you mentioned, he uh, was brought up as a slave in uh, Erastus, a Christian uh, politician running for office businessman. Uh, so m maybe explain to the audience, uh, just so they have a little bit of clarification, what a freedman would be. And what and maybe what the process was to for someone to obtain that? Well, first of all, um, a slave couldn't sort of raise his hand and say, um, I'd like to be free now. This is not a decision a slave could make because a slave was technically a piece of property and property doesn't have votes. <laughs> so uh, it it had to be the owner making a decision about a particular slave 
and and coming to the conclusion that they might be more useful to the owner as a freed person. Now, see, there's a difference between a being a freed man and being a free man. A free man has never been a slave. A freed man quite deliberately is a former slave. The good news about that is that Roman citizenship comes with being freed. That That's the real carrot, if you will. You become a Roman citizen. Uh, whether you were even interested in that before, that's part of the process. And the process is that there's a religious ritual. You go to a particular temple in the city, and uh, the priest goes through the ceremony of manumission, and and then the slave is no longer a slave. That that's what happened, and uh, so Nicanor, you know, had had been a part of Erastus's larger family, of course. And see, this is the thing that most Christians don't fully understand. When we talk about nuclear family, that wouldn't have made any sense in antiquity for a socially elite person. It was always an extended family. I mean, there were the in-laws, there were the outlaws, there were the slaves, there were the parents, there were the children. I mean, any socially elite person had what we would call an extended family, including slaves. Especially if they had things like vineyards or wheat fields, they absolutely had to have workers for those jobs. And that would have been the slaves. They, they were, and there were domestic servants, those who worked in the house, those who cleaned, those who cooked, those who helped the mistress of the house and the master of the house. I mean, the estimate from Paul's day is that 50% of the population of the city of Rome were slaves. This is how big that deal was. Probably that's close in Corinth as well. You know, probably almost half the population would have been slaves. And when we think of slavery, it's a it's a mistake to think of it in terms of antebellum slavery in the South in America because anybody could become a slave. A very well-educated person could become a slave. Uh, and it, it wasn't a racial thing. It was not a racial thing. Whoever the Romans conquered could become a slave uh, by the choice of the Romans themselves. So there were Jews, well-educated Jews who were slaves. There were Greeks who were slaves. There were Scythians who were slaves. Ethiopians were slaves. I mean, you know, there's slaves all over the empire, but it really had nothing to do with racism per se. Uh, yes, the Romans thought they were the superior group of people, ethnically speaking. But again, and again, it had nothing to do with skin color at all. There were many Roman citizens that were were African. Uh, a good example of this would be St. Augustine from Carthage. This was a black man, all right? Uh, and so I'm saying that slavery in that setting was a very, very different phenomenon than slavery in the Old South. Not least because in the Old South, there was no process of manumission. There were like laws against that in Georgia and various other Southern states before the Civil War. I mean, just laws against that. Um, that that's why when we look at Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, that was a radical thing to do because it was going against a whole bunch of Southern state laws. Well, see, the Romans were smarter than us old Southerners were. They realized that you can't keep a man down forever. So they had legally a process by which somebody could get out of slavery if the owner was conducive to doing that. And, and that made for some very, very loyal freed men and freed women in the Roman Empire uh, who are very proud of now being Roman citizens and, and getting a Roman name. What kind of makes the passage in 1 Corinthians, or what we know is 1 Corinthians, make a little bit more sense when Paul talks about 
you have the ability to become free, you know, take it. If you don't, you know, kind of be content and honor, honor your, your master and so forth. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, we have inscriptions, um, from slaves on tombstones that were beloved slaves that were domestic slaves and families. And the inscriptions read things like slavery was never a problem for me. I had food, shelter, and clothing. I had good work to do. Uh, I was never maltreated. I was never beaten. Uh, you know, I, I worked hard. I, 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 they allowed me to raise a family, even though I wasn't formerly married, you know, that was way better than being a slave in a mine. It was way better than many of the occupations slaves had to have outside the home. So being a domestic servant was a definite, could be a definite improvement. On the downside of that is if you had a mean old master, he could beat you within an inch of your life and there would be no legal recourse. I mean, that's the horrible side of all of that. Uh, but fortunately, Erastus was not that kind of person. No. Marcus may have been, but not Erastus. Exactly. So I loved how you did some of the side notes, too, or the sidebars that, you know, kind of brought facts in as you're developing the characters with Nicanor, Erastus, Marcus, and so forth. Uh, maybe we'll just deal a little bit with some of those, some of the, so, you know, the Ispen games, uh, you had gladiators. So maybe we start with gladiators and gladiator schools. Maybe kind of touch on that a little bit and what that meant for entertainment and to the culture. Well, gladiators was a Roman thing. I mean, the Greeks had games. Long before the rise of the Roman Empire, there were the Olympic Games, the Isthmian Games, the the uh, Nicanor kind of games of various sorts, and and they were all over the Greek world. There were games in Ephesus, there were games in Philippi. I mean, on and on, but none of that was blood sports. The originators of gladiatorial combat as a sport we may thank the romans for that's where that comes from and and if you really want to get a picture of that uh you, you can watch the russell crowe movie and and see that right movie <laughs> it is it's a terrific movie it's it's really good and and so <clears throat> who ends up being gladiators well slaves slaves end up being gladiators who are just sort of mobile property. What would happen is uh, owners of gladiatorial schools would go to the slave market in Corinth and buy the hunkiest men they could find, you know, all the Arnold Schwarzeneggers they could get, you know, all the Dwayne Rock Johnsons they could find and train them and, and train them, you know. And so, I mean, uh, the Romans added a brutality to the games through blood sport that the Greeks, many of the Greeks would have seen as abhorrent. The Isthmian games did not originally have anything like that. It was only when it became a Roman colony city that that was an additional thing that went on. I mean, you know, you had running and you had spear throwing and you have races and, and poetry poetry you have discus throwing absolutely i mean you know you you have uh athletic contests but you also have musical contests nero <laughs> nero gee this is a shock nero the <laughs> emperor won, won the musical awards in various games including the isthmian games gee i wonder how that happened or is he couldn't sing a note so how did that happen you know um so the Roman intrusion into Greek culture really changed the character of some of those games, you know, and, and part of that was to keep the Roman soldiers entertained. Because again, these are Roman colony cities. In purely Greek cities, they might not have blood sport. Like Ephesus was just a Greek city, would be a good example. Uh, um, so, but with the Roman cities, oh my goodness, you know, this was 
in some ways the main attraction, especially gladiators fighting animals. That's a big deal. In in Ephesus today, in the, the museum in Kushidasi, they have all of these statues of different kinds of gladiators from the period when Rome decided, okay, well, we'd eat better even run the Greek cities like Ephesus. And they brought their own blood sports with them. And so, um, you know, that's that's one of the things that um, it, it was a, a, a significant portion of the of the culture. And again, it was mainly men. That is the it was attended mainly by men, not by women. Um, the women didn't mind going to the poetry contests or the running races or the chariot races even, but, but not the blood sports. And, and in, you know, the more socially elite educated women, they, they would absolutely have abstained from going to such things as uncivilized. So, you know, um, in some ways that blood sport thing reinforced the patriarchy of the culture. And what, what about, uh, you know, you see uh, currency, coins, bartering, maybe speak a little bit to uh, the economy that uh, would have been going on that in that particular time. And Sure, sure. Well, the, the big picture is this was not a money economy. Uh, the, the background of all this is bartering. Originally, the way money came into it, was as advertisements for political candidates, namely kings and emperors, right? And uh, so there is, was begun, beginning to be a money economy um, before the time of Jesus, during the time of Julius Caesar in the first century BC, and that kept developing. But the bigger network that explains everything is patron and, cli and clients. Right. Uh, the socially elite people would be patrons of various kinds of clients. And if you wanted to get ahead in life, you need to go suck up to some patron and get sponsored by them and get them to loan you, loan you resources or loan you slaves so you could start a business and all that sort of thing. You know, it was as the old saying goes, it's not what you know, it's who you know in a patient and client culture, and it's a reciprocity culture. So what I, what I mean by that is, you know, it's like The Godfather. If you've ever watched the movie The Godfather or any of those movies, that is the ancient reciprocity culture in miniature. I will do you a favor, after which you will do me a favor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and the client can't ever get out of that nexus. He can't ever get out of it unless the master says, you're lousy at this, go away. <laughs> you know, so there's just like no way to get out of that. Well, I think Paul, that's why Paul was so guarded or so insistent that he would not uh, become, you know, involved in that type of social relationship for the sake of the gospel. It, exactly. That's exactly right. He didn't have any problem. He didn't have any problems with receiving support as long as there were no entangling alliances. Uh, you know, he didn't want to become somebody's client in Corinth. And he refused that, you know. That's why, I mean, when you see him practicing his leatherworking practice, it's to avoid patronage. It's not because of the modern idea of raise your own support, you're a missionary. That's got you know, the the tent-making principle of many missionary work, that's not actually a biblical principle because you don't understand that the only reason Paul would do that is he, he's very clear, a workman is worthy of his hire. I deserve to be paid, but I can refuse to be paid, right? And he refused. And when you re refuse patronage, this doesn't go down well with the patron. So there's no question that Paul would have angered some people in Corinth about working with his hands. And, and the Roman attitude amongst the elite, amongst the patricians, was that elite people don't dirty their hands with that kind of work. 
right? That's not the Greek idea, certainly not a Jewish idea, but the Romans who were elite persons, who were patricians, their, their job was not to do anything that, you know, got their toga soiled or et cetera. And uh, the fact that Paul was tanning hides and making sandals and book bags and tents and all this, you know, uh, you could say Paul had an intense ministry in Corinth, but he didn't have that in every city. He, he didn't need to have that in Philippi because he had someone who was prepared to treat him as an equal. Uh, in this case, Lydia and her business, which, by the way, was the making of very expensive purple cloth, which was, uh, in fact, only licensed by the emperor. You had to be a socially elite person to be able to license purple cloth goods for, uh, you know, curates, judicial people, Roman soldiers, that sort of thing. I mean, this is top of the line, Gucci, Uchi, and Gucci clothing, right? Uh, and, and so Paul was perfectly happy to receive financial support from the Philippians. In fact, at the end of his letter to the Philippians, he says, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I don't need any more of that support. You know, stop sending money. Um, you know, because he had a patroness in Corinth. He had Phoebe uh, in the port of Kinkrie. So the the financial piece of all this is is very different than what we might imagine as modern Western persons. And it really pays to know the context. I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. Knowing the social, historical, religious context really, really is a key to understanding how to read Paul's letters. Absolutely. And, and I think you see the conflict with Nicanor as it develops with Marcus, where he's uh it's kind of going into that patriot client relationship. And, I, I, you know, he's like, I don't have a male heir. And, you know, he's going to give him a sum of money to try to bring him over to his side for the political race. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, this was going on from the very top of society all the way through the socially elite. I mean, for example, Julius Caesar didn't have any natural children. Octavian was his heir by choice of Julius Caesar. Uh, you know, it, it, that whole system is different than our system. You, you, can, you can become the member of somebody's family simply by, by chosen to be, being chosen to be part of that family. And that's, that's how Augustus, i.e. Octavian, was Julius Caesar's successor. A Nicanor situation, I guess, financially and socially, that would have, you see the conflict at that point, he's conflicted. You know, I, I've been brought up, been treated fairly by this Christian wealthy man, Erastus, but, but on the other hand, you know, I might want to start looking out after my number one here myself. You know, I got a couple of businesses. This could push me up the social ladder, uh, get this sum of money here, you know, I, you know, I, I could be somebody. I could make a name for myself. Exactly. And see, this is the other side of it that is a little blurry. In old Republic Rome, there were the patricians and there were the plebe plebeians. And, and there were not yet what came to be called new men. People who rose to the top of the social ladder, either because of their business or because of their education, like Cicero, famous orator, right? Uh, uh, th th there was, here are the plebeians, here are the patricians. Well, by the time you get to the first century AD, there were all kinds of ways to climb the social ladder, especially if you were a successful businessman or, you know, you, you actually had some education that made you a famous rhetorician, that sort of thing. Uh, and and so the thing was that the lines were getting blurred. 
there there were people who had like almost no education who nonetheless were business wise and socially elite who did not have a good family name who didn't come from a famous family etc and so it was a mixed situation by the time you get to the middle of the first century AD as to and and money definitely talked in the middle of the first century AD in a town like Corinth not surprisingly because if you got all these short term people coming through town well they don't have time to barter for days and days to do gifts or buy that right they just need to have coins to buy what they need uh, for example if you know the Isthmian games were every two years if you're coming to the games you're going to have to rent a tent and guess who you're going to go to you're going to go to Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, you know and say well okay and <clears throat> when they did that guess what happened they heard the gospel and so you know um Paul was a smart businessman and and one of the interesting things about that that I'll just say as a footnote is that the language that sometimes we have taken to be legal language by Paul is actually business language for example the phrase faith reckoned as righteousness now the whole language of reckoned is business language it's not legal language here are the credits, here are the debits, X is, reg uh, is reckoned as good as Y, okay? Paul was a businessman. He, he was not a lawyer. And the language that he uses to describe uh, how one becomes a Christian person or lives as part of the Christian faith, he uses business terms over and over again. For example, he talks about being a person uh, participating in a giving and receiving relationship. Well, that's a technical term for um, providing resources to a person who's passing through. That That's really interesting. So Paul says when he's going to Rome, and if you read Romans, he says, I'm hoping you will send me on my way. You know, let's have a giving and receiving relationship. You provide me with food and and some resources to take with me if I'm going further west to Spain. Again, it's a different world than the world we live in. I like what Stephen Fowle says. The past is like a foreign country. They do things differently there. The past is like a foreign country. They do things differently there. Well, I think as we read the, the gospel so many times in our modern Western lens, um, there's a tendency to misinterpret scriptures wrongly because we do not know uh, the background, the culture, the people who he's speaking to. Exactly. Exactly. And the more you do know about the context, the better you understand the text. So why would you not want to know this? I once had a student, who uh, a Pentecostal student, and he came up to me one day because we'd been talking a lot about historical context. And he said, I don't know why I need to learn all this historical context. Why well, I can just get up in the pulpit and the spirit gives me utterance. And I said, well, yes, Charlie, you can do that. But it's a shame you're not giving the Holy Spirit more to work with. You know, uh, he, his, he had an anti-intellectual attitude about learning languages and learning history and learning all that stuff. And yet that's a key to actually understanding the Bible. And, you know, so most of them who had that attitude to start with repented of it eventually. Well, that's good. Yeah. So uh, moving on in the story here, we see that uh, Marcus, um, who will do anything, he's a backstabber, cutthroat type guy. Uh, Erastus goes to check, you know, the water system, the aqueducts is not working right. So he's like, you know, I got to go up there and check on this. Uh, and uh, he's got a thug up there that beats him up uh, uh, pretty severely yep. and, uh, to win the election. He's, exactly. trying to, he's trying to take him out to win the election. Uh, yep. He's got money. Uh, he'll buy votes. You know, hey, Ben, I got... Uh, X number of silver here, vote for me. Exactly. Oh, yeah. 
nothing's off the table for him to get what he wants to. Yep. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is the reason we even know about Erastus, well, there's two reasons. Number one, there's the plaque you know, written in stone underneath the theater, the lower theater in Corinth, which reads, it's really an advertisement for running for office. Erastus, for the office of Adile, paved this parking lot, is what it says. <laughs> you know, And you're going, isn't that a bribe? <laughs> that's how we would view it but that's how people in antiquity even honest people ran for office in antiquity i'm going to do this what is called a liturgy that is a public service the word liturgus means a public service it could be a religious service it could be a practical service like paving a parking lot you know and and uh so it, when you get to romans 16 we we have erastus greeting the christians in Rome, uh, and he's called the city treasurer. Well, Adal is the Greek word for city treasurer. So we have confirmation. And this is rare. You know, some Christians have the idea of, oh, if we can just find more archaeological objects, we'll have confirmations of all kinds of things in the Bible in terms of persons and whatnot. It's rare, rare when we find some kind of confirmation written in stone about a, a minor character in the Bible. That's rare. But Erastus is one of those people that we do have such evidence for. Yeah, that that's uh, that kind of builds your faith, kind of the confirmation to see that in the scriptures. I, I think his name is mentioned like three different times, you know, in uh, Romans, Timothy, and Acts. Uh, so, yep. yeah, so yep. you, you kind of, as uh Seeing the progress of the story, um, Erastus, you know, is is taken back home. He's in near death. Uh, things are not looking good for the old boy. And uh, Paul, or Paulus, as he's called in the book, uh, is called upon to come pray for uh, Erastus. And that... Uh, that as kind of a, a turning point, or it's a, it really certainly gets uh, Nicanor's attention um, as a result of all that, and and maybe speak to that about the miracles that people saw during the time of the apostles, and how that was uh, uh, really a gateway or a sign that God used to uh, bring people to the faith. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, we we need to understand that while there were some very good doctors in antiquities like Hippocrates or Galen during the time of Paul, a Roman doctor from Pergamum, in fact. Um, basically, medicine was very primitive. And so ancient people did believe in miracles. They did believe in miracles of healing. Normally, they would go to somewhere like the Temple of Asclepius for a miracle of healing. But in the case of Jesus and various of the apostles and others, you didn't have to do that. They came to you. These doctors made house calls. Jesus went to the house of Jairus, you know, and, and certainly ancient people believed in miracles. They didn't have any problems, you know, they have any problems in believing. I mean, that's a, a modern problem of not believing in miracles. They, they, they had no problems believing that there were many gods who could do many wonderful things. And if they did it for me, well, hallelujah, you know, it's, it's good. So that's kind of the context. So, you know, when, when Paul performs uh, the, the, you know, the famous story of Eutychus, that's, that, that's one of the most hilarious stories. And, and Luke tells it sort of tongue in cheek, you know, Paul's preaching too long in a stuffy upper room in an apartment, in an insula, an apartment complex, and Eutychus falls asleep and falls out the window, you know, and <laughs> Paul, Paul races down to the street, raises him from the dead, makes sure he's still alive and okay, then runs back up and finishes his sermon. I mean, it's a hilarious story. Where was you know? I at? Okay, okay, yeah, start this. Pick up from where I left off. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I've never known a preacher to have to do that. But Paul was, you know, intentional about finishing that sermon. 
And of course, Eutychus is, he's probably a slave because he has a slave name, Lucky. Lucky was unlucky on that day, but then he was lucky again when Paul went and he raised him from the dead. So ancient people had no problem with believing in, in miracles. But the question is, who do you attribute them to? To whom do you attribute them, right? Do you, do you think that these individual human beings are magicians who can perform such things? Do they believe it comes from some god through this human being? That was always the question, you know, where, where did this come from? And, and that's why, if you're really wondering, for example, in the book of Acts, why Peter and others are saying, I do this in the name of Christ, what that really means is, I'm doing this by the power and authorization of Christ. I'm not doing it under my own strength. So that's a disclaimer, really. When you use the phrase in the name of Christ, it's a claim of the ultimate source of where this came from. Yeah, they didn't want to take any credit for it. In fact, I, mm -mm. one of the cities that uh, some miracles were happening, they were calling Paul and was Paul and Silas or the Paul and Barnabas, uh, the gods, you know, like, uh, and, and they were and like, that, that's a that, really hilarious. Calm, calm down, folks. No, we're flesh and blood just like y'all. Yeah, that that is an especially uh, hilarious story in Lustra because they had this backstory of how they were vi visited by Zeus and Hermes in disguise that had shown up in that town at one point in time, right? Uh, and nobody would offer them hospitality except this elderly poor couple. And so uh, Zeus and Hermes revealed who they were and blessed the socks after, uh, off these old people. And when the rest of the term discovered they missed out on the blessing, they resolved that whenever Zeus and Hermes showed up in whatever form, they were going to be ready. <laughs> They're going to be ready to honor them and kill the fatted calf and go the whole nine yards. And of course, the problem was that, that in Lystra, they spoke their own native language. They didn't speak Greek or Latin uh, or, or Hebrew, right? And so neither Paul nor Barnabas knew the, the local language. And it took a while to figure out what in the heck's happening there. So that's a fascinating story. You know, they were they were going to honor Paul and Barnabas as gods because of the healing of a paralytic person. Yeah. So move, moving on, try, we're trying to get through this story, folks. So there's there's a dilemma. He he has to uh, Nick and Nord. I mean, Marcus is wanting a decision. What's it going to be? You know, you're going to side with me. Uh, you're going to side with Erastus. And so he's really conflicted, and he hooks up with the gladiator, uh, Krakus. He thought, you know, wouldn't hurt to have an Arnold Schwarzenegger on my side when I have to go visit uh, <laughs> uh, Marcus and let him know. But I think... You know, as he's just slowly, and, and it was just a masterful job of how just incrementally, you know, uh, uh, you know, Paul has the Damascus experience that was dramatic and, and, and all, but most people, it's, you know, one step at a time, God's, uh, yeah. you know, dealing with them. And, and, and you can see it so clearly in his life. Uh, he sees the contrast between these two men, a Christian uh, businessman and, you know, one who will do anything it takes to get ahead, to win. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe pick it up from there. And maybe well, one we'll... of the things you learn from that is that deception and dishonesty is not merely a, a modern business practice. It was a way of living and getting ahead in antiquity. And what stood out about Jews and Christians is their honesty. No, their word was their bond. What they said they were going to do, they were going to do. They didn't sort of, you know, sugar the pill. They, they you know, and, and so that's how you build a trust relationship, not merely a power relationship. We, by being honest and truthful and, and humble as well. Humility was not a virtue in the Roman world. It's never, ever listed as a virtue. It was quality. In fact, the word, papinophrosune, 
means to act like a slave. That's the word we translate as humility, to act like a servant, right? And, and that was not seen as a virtue except in the biblical tradition. And not, not in the Greek tradition, not in the Roman tradition, no, no, and no. <laughs> and, and so that was something different that would have attracted Nicanor to remain loyal to Erastus and and Paul and and those sorts of people because they treated him fairly and honestly and openly mm -hmm. it, it was really uh and I think it is even today it's the relationship you have with people yeah when he could see you know or, or they can see I, hey I know Ben you know he's not out chasing skirts uh, you know on Friday night uh you know he's a, a He's the real deal with the minister of the word. He's not out here at the local tavern, you know, uh, chomping down a steak and, you know, uh, drinking a little too much. Uh, you know, when, when he's eyewitness to all this and then the glaring contrast again with Marcus, uh, you can see, uh, you know, his, uh, in the beginning, him being neutral, you can see him slowly shift toward thinking there might be something to this Christian stuff. Uh, you know, this, this God, he's performed a miracle right in front of my eyes with, uh, you know, my, my ex master Erastus. And so, uh, when he gives, uh, Marcus the bad news, uh, you know, it's, uh, walking out, he knew there was a price to pay for uh, declining that. So, uh, Maybe Absolutely. speak to that about, you know, what, what he, what was on the line for him, uh, financially, maybe physically his own security. Um, yeah, well, basically you don't say no to socially elite patron. If you're, especially if you're somebody like a freedman, I mean, you're not even a free person or a freed person. You don't, there is, that sets in motion the negative reciprocity cycle. Mm. Revenge. Yes. Revenge. Mm. Because what you, the way it would be viewed in an honor and shame culture is you have just shamed a more elite person. That's what you've done. You've shamed them by refusing their offer. And, and the, how are they going to regain their honor after having been shamed, well, that's going to set up the negative reciprocity cycle. That's what's going to happen. And so, yes, I mean, Nicanor had to know that was the case. He had to know and that there would be a price for that kind of thing, you know, and, and, it, and the price could be steep. It could even cost him his life. Yeah. When he walked out of the house, he had to know that there was a bullseye on his back. Exactly. Exactly. At that point, Marcus was going to say, release the crackers. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, maybe let's, let's uh, kind of put a, a bow on this story here. So he he uh, he goes to the, the house church there. And, you know, we could talk about church, house church, uh, how how that functioned in the first century. Yeah, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. Well, here's the here's the thing. Paul had a strategy. He had an urban strategy, and he knew that he needed to convert certain socially elite people who had homes, who had villas, where there could be a meeting. Otherwise, he's going to have to rent a hall like the Hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus. Much better to have a private meeting in a private home for this new religion, new religion, especially in towns like Athens, where there was a law against any new religions. You know, they were called superstitio, superstitions, and they had to be legally approved by the Areopagus Council. Otherwise not. Now, the, we've already got too many gods and too many religions. We don't need another one. Right. Yeah. And so uh, private homes were all important in Paul's strategy uh, to being able to really ground 
and establish a church plant in the context of a safe social space. And it was an environment where there was a participation among just about everybody that was present. Oh, exactly. It was and, not and just, you, you know, see. you're going to stand up here and give a, a message for an hour. You know, sometimes it may have been that way, but it was more, you know, someone has a word, someone has a song. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can see that can lead to chaos if you read First Corinthians 14. Everybody has a word, a testimony they want to give. Somebody wants to give a prophecy. Somebody wants to speak in tongues. Paul says none of that unless there's an interpreter. You know, otherwise speak to God on your own. And uh, I mean, he's trying to organize the chaos that was a pneumatic, uh, what, what in modern days we'd call a Pentecostal situation. And all of that was going on in the house church. All of that, you know. And uh, And Paul was not in any way wanting to quench the spirit, but he did want it to be done decently and in order so there would be uh, fruit for everybody who was present, even visitors. The word for a person who was uninitiated was idiotes, from which we get an idiot, the word idiot. But what it really means is an uninitiated person, person who doesn't yet know what's going on. They're just visiting, right? And Paul says, and he's very clear to say in 1 Corinthians, we need the speech to be intelligible. Either an intelligible prophecy or speaking in tongues with an intelligible interpretation. Because otherwise, these visitors who come into this meeting are going to think you have lost your mind. And that's no good. So, yeah, that would certainly be a, a stumbling block to them. So Erastus uh, Nicanor is in the meeting, and he senses the presence of God. Exactly. It's like that story of revival. The revival came to him, and he wasn't expecting it. Yes. So he begins to experience the Holy Spirit, the power of God, uh, and has this overwhelming this sense that, you know, the Lord is present, God is present. And uh, he uh, comes to faith. He begins his faith journey, I would say, right right then and there. Yep. During that meeting. There is in the beginning. And here's the thing. When we use a phrase like born again, think about a normal human birth. The birth is just the beginning of the maturation of the child, Right. Being born again is not the end of the process. <laughs> it's the start of the process. And so the rest of the process takes time before you become a knowledgeable, mature Christian person. It may take many years, in fact. Uh, you know, the, the fact that there's a conversion experience is only the beginning of the story. And there are as many different conversion experiences as there are people. I mean, one of my personal favorites is the story about C.S. Lewis, where he says, basically, that there came a day in Maudlin College where God backed him into a corner until he said, uncle. And then C.S. Lewis says, and I became one of the most reluctant converts in all of Christendom. I mean, that's not like I've been redeemed. You know, he was not jumping up and down. He was going, I, I surrender. So conversions can take many forms and they're only the beginning of the process. Yeah. Well, maybe, uh, maybe you need to write a, uh, follow up to this book, you know, Nick and or the, you know, the disciple, uh, because the decision he had made at this point, uh, he was, a lot of times nowadays, it doesn't cost anything to say, oh, you know, oh, yeah, raise your hand. I'm a Christian. But, you know, him turning down uh, Marcus's offer, now he, he becoming a Christian, uh, I would imagine that he was going to be pretty tight with all his people in this house church. Oh, yes. And, you know, if he's a smart man, he would have told Erastus what he had done and, and said, you know what? Uh, I, I may need some protection down the road. 
you're the city treasurer. I may need, I may need some muscle, you know, and, and, uh, and I have thought about actually writing a sequel to that, but InterVarsity had decided, made a, an executive decision because uh, they did a whole bunch of historical fiction for a while and some of it didn't do very well. They made a sort of executive decision not to, to do any more of that for a good while. Uh, I did do one further book on Priscilla, in fact. Uh, there's there's a novel about Priscilla and her story. But, uh, you know, um, it's up to the publisher to decide, to decide about those kind of things sometimes. Well, couldn't you just self-publish it? I could. I, I could. It's very I could. easy nowadays. It, it is, except for the publicity is expensive very expensive um to do it properly and so i i mean i have done quite a lot of fiction for cascade uh and in all kinds of forms most recently i have a book called in encounters with paul in which i tell the story of uh, both friends and foes who met paul and what was their impression of him 25 people and uh so that that's just out this spring hmm Awesome. I will have to check that out. Any uh, closing thoughts or comments on the first, what we know is the first and second Corinthians? Um, any passages leap out at you that you would want to address how you feel like, well, you know, we're getting this wrong and this bothers me. We need to know this. Well, I would say that without quenching the spirit, I, I would want to say that there is just, first of all, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, by one spirit, we are all baptized into the one body of Christ, and each of us is given the same spirit from which we are nourished or drink. He's associating that sort of change, uh, and this is the only place he talks about spirit baptism, baptism by the spirit. It's the only place he talks about that. He does not associate that with an experience subsequent to conversion. He says you're joined to the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's an initiation experience, not a subsequent later booster shot by the Holy Spirit. So the idea of spirit baptism subsequent to conversion is not actually a biblical idea. It's certainly not in Paul. And the other thing, just as a cautionary tale, is that there is nowhere in Scripture that suggests that speaking in tongues is the ultimate proof that you're really born again. It's only one spiritual gift amongst many. And it's a legitimate gift. I have no problems with people who do that today. It's a, a genuine spiritual gift. That's perfectly fine. But it is not the litmus test that proves you're bona fide or not as a real Christian person. Uh, in fact, Paul is perfectly clear. There are different spiritual gifts for different persons. The fruit of the Spirit are supposed to all be manifest in every Christian. The gifts of Spirit are parceled out by the Spirit for the common good, not on the basis of us going to the buffet and picking out a spiritual gift and saying, I'll have that one. It's the Spirit that decides those things. Hmm, that's good. Uh, how can uh, viewers contact you or uh, do you have a website? Do you have are you on social media? What well, the, you can certainly contact me through Asbury Seminary, Ben.witherington at asburyseminary.edu. But I certainly also do have a website which is benw3.com, all kinds of stuff there. And I have a daily blog on the Pathios website as well, uh, which has been running for 15 years now. So all kinds of free material on my Bible and culture blog for the Pathios website. Okay. Thanks for your time, Ben. And again, folks, this is a part of the series, A Week in the Life. This is A Week in the Life of Corinth that we've been discussing. Uh, and thank you for your time, Ben. God bless you. Uh, Good to be with you.